Cool. So we're recording. Um, so hello, everyone. And uh, I'm so excited about uh, having the chance to chat with our next guest. And um, so I'm just going to do what I normally do, which is introduce you. This is Carly Queen, um, Vice President and Specialist Head of the European Ceramics and Glass Department at Christie's. Um, board member of the American Ceramic Circle, member of French Porcelain Society, and the Maiolica International Society. And Carly specializes in 18th and 19th century European ceramics. And I am so stoked. Because <laughs> um, I just am obsessed with ceramics and have my own little weird, strange collection um Ooh. and when you agreed to do this i just felt so grateful because you are such a wealth of knowledge and um carly's chosen some like amazing weird very cool obscure and strange pieces for us today and um so the way the conversation is going to go uh is that we'll talk about each of the pieces and we'll look at three points the cultural and political context how they were made, so the different types of techniques, the glazes, how they were thrown in some cases, uh, or blown, because we have some glass, which is like, wow. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and then how they were used, like if they were gifts, if they were commissions, if they were, uh, one of the things that we talk about, actually a lot of people purchased them, and who was that? Um, and so I think we can just go for it. Let's Are go you? for it. Let's okay. It. All right. <laughs> um, so Carly, is it easier for me to pull it up first and then just have you talk about it? Sure. Okay, cool. Sure. So these are our first guys. Hello. Oh! <laughs> Who doesn't love a pug? <laughs> They're hilarious. <laughs> what are they? So these are porcelain pugs made by the Meissen Manufactory circa 1745. They were modeled by their top um, modeler, uh, JJ Candler, and they are theoretically um, having to do with this wonderful secret society that took place in the 1740s called the Order of the Pug. Okay, can we just pause there for a second? A secret society called Order of the Pug. Yes. Just amazing. But <laughs> tell us more, because I don't think people understand fully how exciting it was, because it was okay. pretty much ahead of its time in many ways. Yes. So Freemason Marie had been a thing for hundreds of years um, and sort of starting at the beginning of the 18th century, end of the 17th century, they start making it more open to all Christian men. Mm. Um, you didn't ha necessarily have to be a Mason, an actual Mason to join mm. um, as, as in like you built things. <laughs> so, right. um, the upper crust of society starts joining these lodges and the, and this, and this secret society and um, Catholics do as well. And by 1740, the Pope Cl uh, Clement XII is starting to get a little bit nervous that it's going to become this den of political activity right. um, to have all these Catholics mixing with other Christians and things. And so he decides to ban Catholics from becoming Freemasons. And uh, a former Mason uh, is very upset by this, Clemens August of Bavaria, who was um, the elector of Cologne. And he, so he decides he's going to start his own secret society uh, like the Masons based on fraternity and um, steadfast morals and things like that. And he's going to base it around the pug, which he has determined <laughs> is... Uh, the symbol of all things steadfast. Um, he may have also been looking to, looking at as a, a sort of a symbol of enlightenment in some sense. The, mm -hmm. the house of the house of Orange had used the pug as um, its its dog of choice uh, mm -hmm. since the 16th century, when I guess a, a pug barking uh, alerted the uh, king to the presence of a would-be assassin. 
Right. And so they, they started using the pug as their symbol. And then when William and Mary came over from the Netherlands to England in the late 17th century, they bought pugs with them. Um, I think he had a pug named Pompey. Uh, and uh, they, they sort of became the symbol of, you know, the English Enlightenment. So right. looking for a little bit of enlightenment themselves, he starts the secret society with the pug as its symbol. And there were all these crazy rituals that took, that, that happened there. Um, and I think you have, well, the picture that you have of, let's see, this one, <clears throat> let me show it. So there's this. Kind of, yes, I mean, the engraving. <laughs> we're just, but this is what, hold on, let me, here we go. Okay. Let's see if it, there it is. Okay. So yes. tell us, What's so this is the Lodge of the Mopses, so Mops Orden is pug, the pug order. Um, to, members had to, like to get in, you had to wear, a, there's some hazing going on, you had to wear a collar, like a dog collar, and crawl on all fours and scratch at the door to be let in. <laughs> uh, you had to wear a blindfold, um, I think this woman looks like she might be, she might be, blindfold. Yeah. she has a blindfold around her, her her forehead kind of yeah right um you would be blindfolded while all the other members would bark at you and you <laughs> had to prove you were steadfast like a pug and you couldn't be intimidated by all their barking wow. and then lastly you had to kiss the bottom of a porcelain pug um which to is, show your complete subservience to the pug which is which is like one so of the would it have been at. like hold on would it have been like this pug so something like yes, that. Something like that. Yeah. And I think you can see in, in the engraving, you can see that she's about to, to kiss one as well. So por this would be a porcelain pug. Yes. That's a, I think that's a porcelain pug that she's uh, getting ready to uh, lay one great. on. So. Oh my God. <laughs> and so one of the things that I noticed that was a little unusual about this is that there are women being initiated into this. Yes. Women were allowed Catholic women were allowed to join. Um, they couldn't be the Grand Master, but there was a uh, Grand Mistress. So she yeah. could be the Grand Mistress. And, okay. um, unfortunately, there, there's not as much information about the society as I wish there was. I looked because it's and I was so like, what weird did and it's do? so cool. <laughs> what did they do? And so, you know, some of the things that I looked at was like, okay, well, what was, you know, because all of the information points to so did it start in Germany? Is that? Yes, it was right. in Germany. What, what, what is now Germany? No, is now Germany, yes. right? So yes. it would have been uh, Prussia at the time? Uh, Bavaria. Bavaria, right? Yeah. And so what's happening during this time? So it's like, there's this, the only thing that I found that kind of offered me, because I'm less familiar with, and, you know, really familiar with French history, being French and I'm really familiar with kind of like the overall arching of European history and then it goes immediately and like I know more about Latin American history than you know I do about what is now Germany but um, the there was a, a pretty strong response to what the the confines of rationalism that were imposed by the Enlightenment and I was like okay this makes sense that they would have like this little this order of the pug, because that seems so abstract and a, a kind of clear response to what was happening, certainly in the Enlightenment thought, where it was like rational and everything had to be. And now there's this like pet that is being worshipped. Were they pets? They were pets. They were pets, yes. I think they came over from China originally in the 16th century, and they started being sort of the the dog to have among the upper crust. <laughs> so. Okay, so that's like 1740. Let's yes. move it into, I mean, if there was ever a good time to talk about this lady, now would be it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Marie Antoinette. So now we're in Bavaria, moving over into France, mm -hmm. uh, 70, she was born in 1755, guillotined in 1793. This time is like super tumultuous in France, but I'm gonna pull up um, the pieces that you picked and maybe we can just start with like the context, right? Let's sure. So 
So here we are. She marries the Dauphin, mm -hmm. or the soon-to-be king, in 1770. And mm -hmm. in 1774, Louis XV dies, and her, her husband, the Dauphin, becomes Louis XVI. And right. she becomes queen of France. And mm -hmm. um, it's a tumultuous relationship from the start. They're not very good at marital relations. <laughs> it takes them eight years to have their first child. Um, but actually, when they do, she, she's, her, she does actually breastfeed her, her daughter, um, which was this new concept at the time. Uh, because uh, they would have other people? Yes. It, uh, the the, the well-to-do, especially royals, would have a wet nurse or somebody that would, would feed your children. And uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau right. uh, wrote this book on child rearing in the 1760s that everyone was really paying attention to that said that breastfeeding was more natural, living in the country was more natural. Um, so she tried to do this with her first child. It didn't really work out with number two, who winds up being um, the next Dauphin because he's he's going to be king. He's sort of taken away from her Take immediately. Her. Right. Uh, but but she is she does try to have these maternal instincts and things. Um, and anyway, so they're married. It's not going. It's it's okay. It's okay. Um, it's great. It's not great. Uh, Louis is really fond of hunting, and he buys the Chateau de Rambouillet, this house that we're seeing on this, you can call it that, this palace that we're seeing on the screen. A small house, and, this gigantic oh. palace. <laughs> in uh, 1783, and she hates it there. She thinks it's this gothic horror. She calls it a toad house. And <laughs> there's nothing for her to do there. They're off hunting all day, and I guess the house is not done up to the tastes of the late 18th, 18th century, etc. So he decides he's going to surprise her and get her to try to be more excited about his hunting trips there by building her a pleasure dairy. Um, oh my gosh. That, and so which, it, she already had a pleasure dairy at Versailles at the Petit Trianon, um, which again sort of invoked these ideas that Rousseau had about um, country living and how it was healthier. She couldn't actually go to the country. She needed to stay near Versailles or near the king, but she could um, she could create these little moments that were like being in the country. And it, it, I mean, to some extent, it was a farce. There's a sort of a real dairy next door to her pleasure dairy that was actually producing things. And then they would bring the products into the pleasure dairy where she and her friends would eat off of beautiful china. Um, uh, so th this is this is a view of the pleasure dairy that we were just looking at there. So, um, and this would be some of the china. Yes. So, so Louis, when he when he commissions the secret dairy for her um, to surprise her with, he also commissions this set of china from the Sevres porcelain manufacturer, which is the royal porcelain manufacturer at the time, to create this neoclassical service that would be all different shapes and forms for serving cheese and dairy products. Um, so you have this little two-handled cup to drink milk out of, perhaps for cubes of cheese then. Um, this, this little cup is actually in the Met. Um, and then there's this one. Yes. So this is the most exciting one, which is just... a breast. <laughs> and the, the breast actually comes out of the little stand with the, with the goats on it. Um, so you, you could dr drink from it. OK. And it's, there's an apocryphal story that it's based on her breast. Um, right. I don't think okay. that's actually true, uh, especially because the whole dairy was a secret. <laughs> but, so it was um, a secret until it was a gift to her. And so yes. I want to just set the scene here for people. So you and I know a lot about French history, but in case there's people who don't, right? So Marie Antoinette is, you know, uh, being queen, Louis the Sixteenth is being king, and they are failing miserably. Because what's happening while things like this are being built um, is that, like you said, Rousseau has written a really phenomenal and important book called *The Contrat Social*, *The Social Contract*. Uh, Voltaire has written *Zadig and Candide*. Then there's *Beaumarchais*, *The Marriage of Figaro*. All of these are slow, kind of like, you know, sideways ways of critiquing 
the monarchy and what's happening, right? And then actually the marriage of Figaro, she like she loved the marriage of Figaro and performed it at Versailles and they wanted to to ban it, but she she was like, Oh she it's my favorite, how could we? And exactly yeah, show it to everyone and <laughs> right. And I think because Beaumarchais was the he was kind of like a part of the royal court, wasn't he? Like he was their theater person, mm -hmm. kind of the person who produced all of the theater. And so all of this is, so there's this kind of like really farcical, um, you know, I guess what we would see as like, you know, a small country store that isn't a country store that people are going to. And, you know, Marie Antoinette is getting all of her little cheeses and stuff and drinking out of these beautiful things while there is an actual real working dairy farm right next to her. And from a literary perspective and a thought mind perspective, society is changing out there yes. in the world outside of the castle. And so, you know, I, I think, and maybe people know this, maybe people don't, but the end of Marie Antoinette at the guillotine and the end of Louis XVI is the beginning of the French Revolution, right? Like that's where this long kind of century of France and it's like political upheaval begins. So this, I feel like is so exciting to look at because it seems so detached from oh totally <laughs> from everything else that's going from on in the world else that's going on <laughs> in the world so can you so i guess i just have some technical questions and we can go to whichever one you want you sure. provided kind of like these beautiful so there's this one which so that's, yeah that's go a, ahead that's, that's a cream jug and it's Actually, it came up for sale at an auction maybe seven or eight years ago, uh, a smaller auction in, in Europe. Yeah. And it sold for seven, no, over $800,000. Wow. Euros, 800,000 euros. Um, That's a lot. The time has been close to a million dollars. Yes. Right? Yeah. Yes. So it's, it, there are only 65 pieces that were made for the service in general. So it, it isn't very big. And all of these are a part of this service. Yes, they're all in this sort of Etruscan style. Um, but wow. it's, it's fun because it's Harlequin. It doesn't all match exactly. It's, I it's love different. that. It has a general look about it. And what were they made of, just to kind of get into the... They are made of porcelain. Okay. So um, everything that we're looking at today, except for the glass, is made of, of porcelain. Um, and can is, you... Tell people a little bit more about what porcelain is because they might not fully understand kind of the sure. skill or what it takes to actually make it. So their porcelain is um, it's very special in that it is non-porous. Other right. ceramic wares um, are porous and liquids will leach out of them eventually if they aren't glazed. Mm. And for hundreds and hundreds of years, the only people who knew how to make porcelain were the Chinese. Mm. Um, so they, they first develop it, develop it in the Tang dynasty. Um, it comes really, it really comes to the fore during the Ming dynasty in China. Mm. So for, for years, the Europeans are starting to see at first drips and drabs of Chinese porcelain and think it's an amazing, wondrous object. You can pour water into it nothing happens if it's not glazed it, you can see light through it it's so thin and fine right. you can ping the side of it and it sounds like a bell um right it's 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 pretty fantastic and it becomes this luxury item that they're importing from china and everyone in europe is crazy to find the recipe of how to make it for themselves um so it sort of becomes this kingly project to um figure out how to make how to make it. Um, Augustus the Strong of Saxony is the first one that actually figures out the formula, which is yeah, right. um, the use of kaolin, uh, a, a mineral that's mixed with alabaster, yeah. um, to create this fine white non-porous material. Wow. And so what is the glaze that is on this? Uh, so the glaze is made out of um, different glassy fritz that are melted in the kiln onto, onto it. What? 
And yeah. so this would be fired in a kiln. Yes, yes. So hard paste porcelain, which this is at this period of time, would be fired around 1400 degrees Celsius. Mm -hmm. um, and then the colors would go on and subsequent firings at lower temperatures. And if there's gilding, the gilding goes on the very last because that's at a very low temperature, only a few hundred degrees. And so here is just a kind of maybe a more, um, this is good, like I'm just going to let my nerd out here, Carly. But so this looks a lot more um, glossy than this finish. Is that right? Or is that just the photo itself? It could just be the lighting. So the, the, cause this one is like a professional Met photo. And mm -hmm. the that photo of the breast bowl is one that I took at a museum exhibition so, um, through a glass case. <laughs> okay. So, so, but, so would you say that they all kind of had this more shiny, um, glossy finish than yes. matte yes. appearance? Okay, cool. So exactly. they're holding little jewels almost, right? They like, are. They're, they are like little jewel-like objects. Oh my gosh, so excessive. Okay, so before we move on, we're just going to go back to this. Yes. Which would be where she has uh, this service served to her? Uh, or, there, I think there were niches in the walls and furniture that it would have sort of, the pieces would have been set out on. She, she also had, or I guess Louis commissioned um, there to be dairy buckets made out of porcelain and painted as faux bois or like an, an imitation of wood so that they looked like real dairy buckets, but they were made out of <laughs> porcelain. <laughs> um, so like so totally, excessive. everything's totally over the top. So excessive. Yes. All right. So, well, you know, we know what happens to her off yeah. of her head. She was like insisting on eating cake while the revolution was happening outside. I mean, just such a significant story around kind of the, like the, uh, ignorance of inequities, which I think is on everyone's mind, especially right now with what's happening. So it just it's so beautiful to see, and also to also hold um, kind of this belief, I believe, in beauty still. And I think um, celebrating that and also knowing the history of these beautiful objects, because I don't think that they, um, that um, beauty and equity are mutually exclusive but in this, right but in this particular case it failed miserably yes. and um so french revolution happens and um let's talk about these plates okay now how do you say the she'll name? share yes okay. that's how i say it but you're french so tell me no, how to say it wrong. i'm like it's not it's like uh it must it's it's short share way but it's i mean it i've i was like how many s's and h's are next to this this is not french but it is it's french so oh they're here let's just talk about them really quickly okay <laughs> um so i love I love this little service. It was in the David and Peggy Rockefeller collection um, that we sold two years ago at Christie's um, in 2018. And everything was sold for charity, so all for a good cause. Uh. Um, but they had 68 different dinner services that we sold, that, and they used them every day. Um, and I, David Rockefeller said, and I love this, that if you ever ran out of things to say, you could talk about the China. And yes. I would love to have somebody serve something to me off of one of these plates and you look down and you see this, like, ah. these amazing scenes. Um, we'd have a lot to talk about. Okay, so. so they're by the Schulcher Porcelain Factory, which is started at the very, very end of the 18th century in France. Um, a gentleman, Marc Schulcher, comes to Paris. I think he wants to be a um, priest, actually, uh, but the revolution, sort of puts put the damper on that. <laughs> um, and he winds up working for a family member that, that has a porcelain factory and decides to strike out on his own and, and create his own after he's sort of learned the tricks of the trade from them. Um, and so this service is sort of circa 1815 or so. Oh, and I love that, and I love that he was going to be a priest because the scenes, some of the scenes that are <laughs> on this thing are amazing. Um, this is one of my favorites. So it has these little cupids storming 
uh, a cloister <laughs> attacking the nuns, threatening them with love, like <sighs> not like the love of God, but like mortal love. And they're like begging for, for they're begging for like, please save us, please save us from this horribleness. Yeah. Um, and this, this I like, it's, it's the, uh, sort of nun's revenge in some sense. It I mean, really is. It's they're they're like, swinging their rosaries over their head at them. They're cheering them on from the from the top of the cloister. Uh, the caption says that it's la mort chasse de cloître, du cloître. Yeah. which means they're they're the the cupids are hunting, right? No, it right. means the cupids are being ex, are being um, chased. Okay, out. good. Good. They're okay, they're the hunted. Of they're the, the hunted. of the cloister. Yeah. Excellent. They're trying. They're trying. That's what I thought. They're trying to. They're trying to get them <laughs> out, and I love escape. this like the rosary is my the favorite. rosary around <laughs> the head, just kind of like going for it. It's just beautiful. So how did they? Okay, so let's just back up a little bit because I immediately want to get into like how did they make these? So what's the um. What's the kind of cultural, political landscape of these plates? What's the time frame? Okay, so it's circa 1815. So you okay. have, unfortunately, we don't know exactly the year. Um, some how long did some, they make? How long did they make plates like this for? For like 20 years or so. Wow, so not a long time. Not a long time. So it's in this window, but Sev the makers of the breast bowl we just looked at keeps yeah. very meticulous records about um, the things that it made, particularly royal gifts. So we know exactly how many pieces were originally in the set. We know exactly the year it was made, mm. who the artists that worked on it were, et cetera. Mm. Whereas this, um, it's a smaller factory. It doesn't have royal patronage or anything like that. And so th th there are less records. So it's a little bit more nebulous. Um, so 1815, it's either you know, Napoleon's still in power or just coming off. It's the rise of Louis the 18th. <laughs> it is a mess in France. It is. It's a hot mess. <laughs> it's a hot, I mean, so just to give you guys an idea. So this period in France is typically called like the long 19th century because it goes from like the end of, <laughs> it's like ends with Louis XVI, the beheading of Marie Antoinette, and then the French Revolution, and then there's Napoleon. Well, no, in between the end of the French Revolution, there is, I wrote it down because I was like, oh my gosh, there's so much that's happening here. There's like some like 10 year period of uh, the Republic, not the Republic, what do they call it? Oh, oh. in my notes. It's like those 10 years where where are they? The first one, the oh, I don't know. And then Napoleon comes, and then Napoleon fails, and then there's Louis XVIII, and then Napoleon comes back. And all of this is happening like within someone's lifetime, which is super relevant to these last guys that we're going to go and look at because they've seen so much. But so this is being made, and who is it made for? So it's hard to say exactly. It's going to be somebody fairly well to do to be able to afford a dinner service like this, but not necessarily in the echelons of, of royalty. Um, okay. But but somebody pretty well to do or up there, maybe a minister in government or something. Okay. Like that. All right. So this would be something that a bourgeois, you know, the members of the ones who started the French Revolution would, you know, be purchasing. So this is you know, this, okay. All right. And are yes. they buying? So this is something I don't know. Did people typically buy a full set? So this, what remain, at least what remains here is what we would call a dessert service mm -hmm. so specifically for the dessert course. And you could, and you might have a completely different service that was for dinner. And at this point, something called service à la russe, mm -hmm. Is very popular um, versus service à la française. For mm. Service à la française was in the 18th century the custom of sort of piling all the food on the table, looking very grand and spectacular, and eating what you wanted all at once. Versus service à la russe was when you sat down and there were courses brought out to you already on the plate. Uh, uh, that's know, when that started. French have claimed that as theirs, actually. That's 
it's so typical of the French. <laughs> so we did that. And that's ours. That's, 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 we did that. Yeah, of course. So basically, they were just kind of like flamboyant, you know, excesses on top of the table. Service yeah. de la Russe is it's cooked elsewhere and plated, brought to brought out to you. Please. So you know you'd be receiving the dessert, and then you'd get to the end, and you'd look down, and you'd have this fantastic scene on your plate. <sighs> okay, and I'm sure I'm sure they're all based on engravings of at, from the time. I could not find the engravings, unfortunately, but I did using the like little phrases that are on there. I did find several other items that have the same scene printed on them, like little snuff boxes and things. So it's, they're definitely based on engravings. And how is something like this made? So um, the plates are slip cast, yep. um, usually hung to dry and then fired. Mm. Then you would do, uh, I guess these are transfer printed. Right. So there would be a printed <laughs> sort of a decal that went on to them. Yeah. And and that would be fired on. And then last the gold would be added at the at the lowest temperature. And is that gold that's around the edge, would that be gold leaf and then fired and then glazed? Or gold leaf glazed and then fired? Uh glaze. Then gold leaf is last on top the of everything. Last on top of it. Yeah. And so, and then it's fired and then that's it. And how did they do their signatures at the, at what point? I mean, I guess I could have asked this on everyone, but at what point does the signatures or the imprint come in at the end? Is that done once it it's finished or? It depends on the factory. So Mycin, the Blue Cross Swords um, are its, factory mark or symbol that goes mm. on the bottom, like it would be on the underside of the pug. Mm. Um, and that goes on in the first firing. Got um, it. It's because it's under glaze. Um, Sev usually does it in the second firing in an over glaze blue. Um, and right. they often, and so there's, the, Sev has very elaborate marks. Um, it's usually the, the L intertwined L's for Louis. And then in the middle, there's a date letter that, so, uh, you know, date letter A is 1753. Right. And B is 1754, C and onwards. Wow. Um, and then there's also little symbols that uh, are for different artists at the factory. And like, you can, you can find all those different artists and look them up and the guilders and look those up. So, because this was, an, I mean, this was considered a skill, like an artisanal skill that people apprenticed for, yes. right? And a, 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 yes, and a lot of times um, they're, they keep it in the family. It's like a family yeah. skill. Like you do it, you teach your son or daughter to do it, they come and work with you at the factory and then they become a, a painter as well. Right, so you bring so, up a family we might as well go to the family. Oh, yeah, let's go to the family. <laughs> okay, so I'll show these um, so that people can see them. I just, oh my gosh. These are so I'm, good. I'm, so I'm obsessed with birds um, and also what is in the ocean. And I think that it's just like, categorization of them and being able to identify, I don't know, but I saw these. I'm really into those too. I love, I love identifying fish. I'm really into snorkeling. Really? Okay. <laughs> well, we'll spare everyone, but okay. <laughs> so anyway, let's just gather ourselves. Here are these, I mean, I just, I want everyone to just look at them and then we'll, um, I'm just going to go through them and then we can. So these are made of glass. Yes, they are. <laughs> <laughs> this is hand-blown glass. It's like wild. These glass. This one's amazing. Like that's glass is crazy. That's bananas. Okay, so everyone now is like listening really intently. Who made these? Okay, so these were made by a father and son team, uh, Leopold and Rudolf. Blaschka, who live in Dresden in sort of the mid to late 19th century. Um, Leopold comes from a family of glass workers and he's running a successful 
lamp working business. So lamp working is not, it's different from blown glass. You usually work with sort of a, a torch of fire and little rods of glass that you sort of melt down to create little bijou, like little jewel-like objects. Right. Um, so he's, he's doing it to make scientific equipment and glass eyes. <laughs> So, it makes uh, little sense to me. Not, I mean, not, like, I quite, get it. not quite what you see there. But so he. But Dresden at the time was known for its a couple of things, but one of the things that it was known for was its medical equipment. Like, yes. which is, a, you know, kind of as an aside. So it's not too weird that this guy was making glass eyes, but Dresden was known for also for uh, auto industry, things like that. But its medical equipment was one of the, one of the big things um okay so this guy's making glass eyes yeah so he, make, he makes glass eyes um and sort of as a side hobby he starts making little glass flowers and <laughs> he makes glass eyes for a uh french nobleman and he sort of, he sees some of these little glass flowers on the side and decides that that he's like oh my god these are amazing like I mean, this part's a little confusing because I'm not sure. Maybe he just has one glass eye. <laughs> if he's seeing these glass flowers, <laughs> I guess it just must be one. Um, <laughs> so he sees these little. He sees this. I don't think they're as elaborate as this at the time. They're just sort of something he's doing offhand. He sees these, and and besides needing a glass eye, this this prince is also a. Um, avid botanist. So he asks him to make a bunch of glass orchids, which he does as a favor, as a side project. Okay. Um, Hold on. He, he, <laughs> and how, how is he making that petal? So uh, let's all imagine that this is an orchid. So he's making this glass, like what, how is, how is that happening? So he's heating up these little rods under his torch and using um, tools, like little, like, metal tweezers to pull or to flatten and little paddles made of wood to flatten these out so that they're super thin oh. keep them. But they have to be pretty hot to be able to keep the glass um, malleable. Oh so, so he makes these orchids and the director of the History Museum in, in Dresden sees them and he's like, these are amazing. And you know what? I have been trying, so I guess we should say, first of all, history museum, natural history museums become a huge thing right. in the late 19th century. Right. Everyone is into science. Um, Darwinism <laughs> is going on as, as, you know. Everything. I mean, everything, they're, everything. Like, they're, I mean uh, they're categorizing everything. Yes. They're going around. There's like, you know, like it's just, you know, all There's of the books are happening too. Colonialism. So people are spread further and further across the globe and bringing right. things back. and. Right. So, so they start opening these natural history museums. So this director sees these flowers and thinks, oh my God, I've been trying to think of a way to display um, marine invertebrates, <laughs> which are, which it's not like a mammal where you can stuff it and put it on a shelf to, no, here, for people I'm to just, study and observe it. Let everyone, this is so... This is a beautiful marine invertebrate. It but is. This is also what he was thinking of. Yes, exactly. <laughs> these things where you can't, I mean, you can try to put them in a jar with alcohol, but they're going to lose all their color and eventually become some sort of amorphous blob. <laughs> yeah, like there's not really a way to display them. So he, he has um, the Blaschkas create these, these creatures in glass for, dis for display, um, both as study materials and for display in these museums. And so word gets out and they start this very successful business transporting these around the world. Uh, Cornell University has a really big collection. Most of the pictures that you're seeing, this, this one is actually one that we sold at Christie's maybe two years ago. They don't come up on the market very often at all. But because who has them? No. Mainly they're in still in uh, the collections of universities and museums. So the, all the other marine invertebrates that we saw are at um, Cornell yep. and the Corning Museum of Glass, which is a really great museum. If anyone ever has a chance to get up to Corning, New York, it's amazing. Oh um, <laughs> did a really great exhibition of these a few years ago. Oh. Uh, so they're making these marine invertebrates. They're 
they're, you know, they're making a lot of money doing it. They're doing, they're, it's, it's a, it's a rip roaring trade. And <laughs> so who's buying, cause that was the other thing, right? Like up until now we've seen it for like very exclusive, you know, kind of high society patrons the, yes. are the one, you know, or royalty. And now, uh, which are being purchased as, you know, sets or here is an entire, you know, palace and here's all of the, you know, the entire dinner and dessert set that goes with it. Whereas these are like small objets, sure, that are part of a series, but were people going in and then being like, I want just this one? I'm sure you could. It was, I mean, it was a mail order business. So, um... <laughs> What do you I think, mean? I think there were catalogs and you could say like, give me three nudie branches, please. <laughs> In glass? In glass, yeah. Wow. So, oh um, gosh, I, I love this so much. I want, I want all of them. Okay, so. Okay, so then uh, the Boston Natural History Museum gets about 130 of these specimens. Oh. So, so the Boston... So Boston has these, and Cambridge, Harvard is looking to start a new botany museum, and, mm. and they want to fill out its botany department. Mm. And so the curator sees these creations in glasses of, you know, marine invertebrates, and thinks, I wonder if these guys can make flowers. Oh my God. And he reaches out to them, and they're like, no, we don't really do that. And he goes to see them in, in Dresden. And, and they're like, no, we don't really do that. And he looks and he sees some of the orchids that he may, had made years and years ago. And he said, what are you talking about? I see some of these right here. <sighs> and he eventually convinces them to try this um, for them. But it proves to be extremely time consuming. And he winds up, they wind up having to basically, and they're like, you know what, we really can't do this and run, make these flowers and run our business with a marine invertebrate. So Harvard, Fine. And run our mail order glass invertebrate business. Thing. Yes, That's yes. All that we have. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> so he finds he finds this former uh, botany student um, whose last name is Ware, and her mother, who are very well off, and he gets them to finance the blast goes for ten years to create wow. these flowers for them and glass. Um, and I think they get paid something like eight eight thousand something uh, marks a year which I tried to do the math and my math is not so great. I had to call my sister and like trying to figure out historical <laughs> <laughs> currency conversions. But I mean, I mean, it was the equivalent of, I think hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars they were paying them wow. each year to create these glass flowers for them. Okay. Exclusively. So talk to me about how they were made. So, so, they were, yeah, so this, go ahead. The same way as the marine invertebrates, but um, so they, they planted, at first they started with, I think, plants that were native to Dresden. Okay. And um, Harvard started sending them seeds and cuttings and things so that they could, the climates were similar. They were able to grow um, some North America uh, flora there that they could right. then copy in glass. And then eventually uh, Rudolph, the son, takes a trip across the ocean. He visits, he visits Cambridge. He sees what they've done so far in glass cases there. And then he goes on a little trip around the US and to Jamaica to look at all these different tropical, the tropical plants and flowers in Jamaica and just the and cacti in the Southwest and right. things like that to, so that he can reproduce them in glass. He does, like Looking at a drawing of them won't help. Like if he creates his own drawing though, he knows what they look like. He creates these amazing cross sections as well. And they wind up having him produce cross sections of plants like, so you could see the insides of them and understand them better as well. And actually, actually they even have him produce at one point um, uh, plants that have been blighted. So, you know, like a, a banana with a fungus all over it. Whoa. So that students trying to learn how to see what a fungus looks like on these plants to, if they're trying to um, work with them in some sort of commercial capacity would know what to look for. Wow, these are mind blowing. So uh, I understand how they made the petals. How did they make the spikes of 
either the cacti or even just the little pollen pieces, the very delicate pollen on the inside of the flowers. Because I understand, you know, so when I was little in France, there's famous Buot glasses. And so you go down and, the, you know, mm -hmm. my only understanding really of blown glasses, there's really long, uh, you know, separation between the, the blower and the flame. And then they blow and turn <laughs> and make the shape and do the thing. But these things are like this, like, yes. So so the these aren't blown, so they're, they're, you're sitting at a table with your little flame here and your little rod that you can, you're like holding with your hand and you're very delicately heating it up until it gets a little bit melty and then, you know, pulling it into like a long thin tendril that you snap off and then heat the bottom up and then stick the, stick the cacti sticker <laughs> to the side of the rest of the cactus. And talk to me about how color gets into the glass. Uh, so... That's a good question, because um, I'm not sure what method they use. Usually, you can take clear glass, and if you you can roll um, different minerals, like right. so cobalt the, or something, and to make a blue doing into it. This was glass, and you roll you roll it onto you know yes. this being whatever the mineral is. You're rolling it so that it covers it. Then you blow it again and it, everything just kind of synthesizes exactly this alchemy together. And so um, I think that probably would have done been done beforehand and they'd be using the little glass. I imagine the little glass rods were already colored in whatever colors he was using, right. but right. he probably had to, I don't know if he made the glass rods himself or if he, if he purchased them, but he, I would imagine if you're making these very specific plants that need to have very specific colors. Um, you probably had to make them yourself. Yes. Yeah, so to, to, to otherwise it, they're not going to look right. Right. Cause you need just the right shade of yellow to evoke um, one flower versus another. Right. And here are all of these different shades of right. green. The fern. Oh my God. Ugh. God. Okay. All right. Um, Carly, <laughs> wow. Like we, I was like, I don't know if we're going to make it to an hour, but we totally have. And I feel like <laughs> we could have done more. <laughs> um, but you know, I, I feel like this is a great place to s stop. Um, yeah. And, um, I just am so grateful for your time. And now that I know that you uh, love uh, fish and categories and things offline. We'll have to really get into that because that, that is my jam. Where I am, I get to go out and bird watch uh, every day. <laughs> and it's, it's, uh, it's kind of amazing. I've seen like a bunch of um, really strange, unusual ones, but the one bird that I did see, I've only ever seen it once uh, on a tree is the big pileated. Woodpecker. Woodpecker? Mm -hmm. I've seen it once on a tree. And they're I so big. Them. They're gigantic. And I saw one in flight. And they're very rare to see in flight. And it just kind of like flew straight across. Wow. Yeah. So um, anyway, we'll get into all that. Thank you so much. It was for my your pleasure. Time. Um, and uh, I'm going to stop recording. And then you and I will get to say like a, a proper goodbye. So uh, thanks, everybody.